Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. So good morning. Welcome. Uh, in this room, in the woodlands, uh, online, however it is that you're here, we're glad that you're here uh, today. So... Uh, let me tell you about our preacher for the day. His name is uh, around here fondly. He's known as Sully. Uh, Michael Sullivan is our business administrator. He was, for a year or two, our young adult pastor. And before that, he was an intern back uh, in one of the summers when he was still at Texas A&M. And so uh, a lot's happened in his life, and he has a very good uh, word to share uh, with us about some of what's happened here in just the last several years. He's going to come shortly to bring God's word to us as we continue the Transformed series. But first, let's take a look at one more video piece just so you can see the story of another family whose life is being transformed by the gospel. Take a look. I'm Blake, and this is my wife, Connie. And we've been coming to Faith Bridge for about seven years now. We have a two-year-old daughter named Claire and a baby on the way. We started getting involved in Faith Bridge uh, just because we heard a sermon about serving, and we wanted to go to a place that there'd be a big need. So we went for Curious, signed up for that, and that was a big commitment. It's been wonderful, and we've really enjoyed that. We've been serving for about six or seven years now and have watched our kids grow up from sixth and seventh graders to seniors. Those kids who I knew when they were seventh graders are now off at college and going to class and they're adults. It's, it's unbelievable, but it's, it's just a rewarding experience to see them grow like that. Even serving, we found community with the other curious leaders and uh, the parents. And I mean, we couldn't walk through the atrium without just seeing someone we knew. We both grew up in Christian communities, so when we first got to Faith Bridge, tithing, you know, wasn't even really a question. We were going to do it, we were going to jump into it, and it wasn't an issue. We had two incomes at the time, and it didn't really become a sacrifice until we lost Connie's income so she could be a stay-at-home mom, and that's when it became a little more difficult. That's when we had to start making sacrifices to tithe. The timing was ironically right as the all-in campaign was happening a few years ago. It was right as we lost my income because I was staying home. We really think about how we spend our money and um, when Pastor Ken talked in the All In campaign, it just really made me think and he explained like, what if you are doing this with your money, what more could God do with your money? And so a lot of our purchases, especially our big ones, we stop and think about like, is this something we really need, something that we really have to have? or could this money be spent for God in other ways that's better? I think honestly sometimes too some of the hardest parts, if I'm being really honest, is looking at social media and seeing other people and seeing the trips they take and seeing them going out to eat all the time and oh look at this new thing and and it's like oh I wish I could do that but that's just that's not how God calls us to live and that's not how God, God calls us to spend our money. I feel like There have been a lot of conversations of, oh, I wish we could do this, or I wish we could go out to eat more, or I wish we could go on this trip. But I don't think there's ever been a time where we've thought, oh, you know, we should quit tithing so we can do this. As a family, we're okay with going without some of our wants, so that way other people can have what they need. God has really proven himself to be very faithful throughout all of this, through, you know, going down to one income for a while, and Blake is in the oil and gas industry, which we all know is very up and down right now, but it's amazing the amount of peace I have felt knowing that we are doing what God has asked us to do with with our money, and we're trusting Him with our money, and that He's going to take care of us. And there's been several times where we've had unexpected big bills, um, medical bills, or t- new tires. It's it's hard to explain, but it's God always works it out. He's He's always worked it out for us. It just kind of showed me that, you know, God is taking care of me, and and that 
I love my family, but God loves my family so much more, and He's going to take care of us regardless. Well, amen to that story, yeah? Well, like Pastor Ken said, my name is Michael Sullivan, and it's great to be here with y'all this morning. Uh, The last time I was on this stage was about five months ago. Uh, It was on Senior Sunday. Uh, That's something we also refer to as Transition Sunday. And I learned a really valuable lesson that day, Uh, and it's that you should never preach about something you don't want to live yourself, because my life has been nothing but a transition uh, since that point. Ken mentioned one of my transitions was when I went from the young adult pastor position here at Faithbridge to the business administrator. Uh, That's been a great transition. I've really enjoyed getting to use the gifts that God has given me in ministry in a new way here at Faithbridge. So that's been awesome. But I will be honest and say it's not nearly as fun. It's not nearly as exciting as the transition I made on September 27th. uh, And that was from being a single man to a married man. Uh, Yeah. So I got married to a beautiful young lady named Jill, formerly Kiesel, now Sullivan. She serves our uh, FSM ministry uh, upstairs every week, and uh, it's been great. We've really enjoyed a first month of marriage, uh, but I've been really busy the last five months and transitioning quite a bit, but excited to be here this morning. Uh, We're going to continue this transformed series that we've been in. Uh, Ken kicked it off. Two weeks ago, he talked to us about what would it be like to awaken uh, to, this, to the gospel when it comes to generosity? What would it be like to let the gospel just change our lens when it comes to generosity? And so he did that two weeks ago. And then last week, we had Julie here. Uh, she gave an amazing message on what it would be like to surrender our giving to God. And I'll tell you, it was an, a great word. If you weren't here, I know it was kind of rainy last week too podcast it. It was a great message, and so I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, This morning, we're going to continue, and we're just going to talk about what would it look like to prioritize generosity, and so that's what we're going to do. Before we do, why don't we just pray together and ask God to come and teach us something this morning. Well, God, I'm thankful for this morning. Thank you for uh, everyone who came in this morning, everybody who ventured out in the rain to come and just meet with you. And uh, God, I just want to pray right now um, that in this season of holidays, in this season of busyness, God, things can distract us from you. And so I just pray right now that maybe for the next 20, 30 minutes, we would just focus in on you and that you would speak to each of us directly. God, teach us to be still and just know who you are. And God, I pray that you would give everyone in this room faith, Lord, faith to trust where it is that you might be leading them this morning. And uh, God, I just want to pray that anything uh, that I say this morning that's not from you, God, that it would just be forgotten as soon as uh, everyone leaves. But Lord, if there's something that's from you and your heart, God, would you just let that resonate deeply this morning? God, we love you. We're thankful for a chance to come and worship you this morning. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when I was in college, I would often return home to Abilene, Texas. That's where I'm from, to spend Christmas breaks with my family. Uh, Specifically, I like to spend those breaks with my older brother. Uh, He stayed home for college. He went to Abilene Christian University. I was off at Texas A&M. And so when I would have that month Christmas break, I would go home and spend some time with him. Uh, I can remember on one Christmas break in particular, he decided to take a business class. During his time off, he wanted to take two weeks to take this class, and I read the description and decided to join him in that, and the class was made up of two parts. The first was a series of CEOs and CFOs who were going to come from large corporations, but they were also believers, Uh, they were Christians, and so they would speak to us about what was it like to be a Christian in one of these large corporations. And then the second half of the class was a series of case studies that they had put together for us. And so they just kind of looked and said, hey, if you're going to be a a Christian business leader one day, this is something you might face. And so they presented us with these case studies to work through in groups. And one of those case studies was a case study where you're working for a corporation and the economy tanks. Budgets are being cut and you are offered to either leave the company to look for a new job or you can stay on, but you're going to have to take 
a $20,000 pay cut. And so if you chose to take that pay cut, which it was pretty much you needed to, or else there would be no case study, uh, but as you took this $20,000 pay cut, you would go back to your personal budget and figure out where is this money gonna come from? And so the case study gave us several line items. There was uh, probably the line items you have on your budget. Honestly, it was like rent or mortgage, uh, a mortgage. There was a car payment. There were utility bills like water and gas and electricity. Uh, there was a cell phone bill. There was health insurance. There were all these bills. There was a, even a line item for an annual family vacation. Uh, there was a line item for Timmy's baseball class and Susie's dance lessons. I mean, there was all this stuff. And then there was also saving and tithing. And I remember we started to, to work through this budget and we, it was easy, really, at first. It was very easy because we said, well, we'll just eat out a little less and uh, save money by eating at the dinner table and cooking it ourselves. We can reduce uh, down to one car uh, and get rid of a car payment. We can cut cable. That's not really a necessity. And so we made these decisions, but as we were making them, we realized quickly that's not going to be enough to get us there. And so we were forced to make some difficult decisions as a group. We were having to decide, are we going to cut the annual family vacation, the one that we've taken each of the last five years that our kids love? Are we going to have to give up our family dog and ask a neighbor to take it in or ask an aunt or an uncle to take it? Are we gonna have to sit our kids down and say, hey, Susie, I'm sorry, you can't do dance lessons anymore. Or hey, Timmy, Little League Baseball's out this spring. We don't have enough money for that. And I remember in the midst of that conversation, we were debating back and forth, and one of my group members just finally said, hey, what about tithing? What about giving? You know, if we cut that, then we could actually make our budget and add a few things back in. We could get cable back. And we looked at it and she was right. If we stopped giving, we could come in under budget. And so our group voted and giving was cut and we made it under the $20,000. And it's interesting, but here we are years later and I'm facing the same case study and I'm sure that many of you are facing it right now. It's real life. The oil markets are down, the budgets are being cut, and you're forced to decide, what is the priority going to be in my budget? Is generosity going to be something that I prioritize, and how do I do that? And so that's the question I want to answer this morning, is how do we prioritize generosity in a season of scarcity? And so if you will, grab a Bible. I'll invite the ushers to come forward if you don't have a Bible. Uh, go ahead and flag them down. If you don't own a Bible, that's our gift to you this morning, so feel free to take that home with you. Uh, but everybody needs a Bible this morning, so grab one. We're going to be in the book of Habakkuk, and I know on this rainy day where you got an extra hour of sleep, many of you woke up this morning and you did your devotional in Habakkuk, and you're just killing it. Uh, but for those of you who are like me and did not, and they're like, where is Habakkuk? I don't even, is that really a book of the Bible? It is. Uh, look in your table of contents, or one way I like to find it is by simply turning to the book of Matthew and then going back into the Old Testament a few pages, and you should be able to find it. Uh, we're going to be in Habakkuk chapter 3. That's the last chapter in Habakkuk, and we're actually going to look at the last few verses. We're going to pick it up in verse 17. So if you'll turn with me, we'll begin reading Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. It says this. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights." If ever there was an example of scarcity in the Bible, it is this text we just read. Here in the Old Testament, you hear the words of Habakkuk, and, and just to paint the scene, this group of Israelites was in the agricultural business. Essentially, they were farmers, and so your livelihood, if you were going to put food on the table or have money in the bank, it was coming through the crops in the fields and the cattle and your pen. And so he's describing this situation. And so I want to read it to you again so that you can feel this text a little bit. And I want you to think, what would it be like to be a farmer in this situation? So just listen again and think like you're a farmer. It says, the fig tree does not bud 
and there are no grapes on the vines. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. When you listen to those words and you think about being a farmer, it becomes evident very quickly that this isn't just a short season of scarcity. This is a great depression. If we're talking 2015 Houston, Texas, what Habakkuk is saying is there is no grocery store with any food. The banks have stopped loaning out money. Construction has come to a halt. There's no oil in the pipeline, or maybe in today's economy, there's too much oil in the pipeline. And what he is describing is a desolate situation. But it's interesting, in the midst of that situation, in the midst of what looks like a great depression, catch what he says. He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. And that really is the first step. If we're gonna prioritize generosity in a season of scarcity, it's to rejoice in the Lord during the season of scarcity. It's to rejoice in the Lord during a season of scarcity. And I will confess to you, as I was pondering this outline and thinking about this talk, when I wrote that in, that that's the first step, to rejoice in the Lord, that was hard for me. I just began to think, how could you rejoice in this situation? What are these people rejoicing in? There's no food on the table, there's no money in the bank. How could you rejoice? And then forget Habakkuk, I was thinking, what about us? Think about today. I've got friends who are losing jobs and I've got other friends who are just wondering, am I gonna be the next one to get a pink slip? How do you rejoice in that moment? And so I kept looking at scripture and I found that time and time again, we see this call to rejoice in the Lord. In fact, in Philippians 4.4, 4, it says it ever so plainly. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And in case you're wondering who wrote that, that's the Apostle Paul. And he wasn't writing that verse when he was in a really cheery situation. He was writing that from prison. And so as we look at Paul and we look at Habakkuk, we see there's two things they have in common. First, they're in the midst of some really bad spots. We've got Habakkuk with a great depression and Paul in prison. But the second thing that they have in common, and it's key for us, is that they're both saying, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And as I was thinking about that, I realized, and maybe some of you are like this, if you're having an issue rejoicing in this season of scarcity, it's probably because you tend to focus on your circumstances. That's what I do. I tend to look at my circumstances and I rejoice in those, and so when they're changing or they're different, I find it hard to rejoice because so much of my attention is focused on my circumstance. It's not focused on my Savior. When I was in my final year at Texas A&M, I was finishing up my master's and sitting for the CPA simultaneously. Uh, and that's a very brutal semester for an accounting major. You're studying, and really, the CPA exam is, is the goal, right? Everybody wants you to be a CPA as an accountant, and so you're working really hard. I was studying seven to 10 hours a day for a month of accounting, and yes, you can say that is terrible. It was awful. I mean, really, I'm an accountant, and that was torture. It, it should not be allowed, but it was the requirement to, to pass these exams. And so there's four of them that you take, uh, and so I'd been preparing for a month to take the first one, and I guess they just really want it to be hard. And so instead of a passing score being a 70, they say it's got to be a 75. Uh, and so I sit and I study and I'm ready and I go and I take the exam. And I finish the exam, I walked out, and a few weeks later I get the grade back. And it says I made a 74. One point short from passing. And I'll tell you, I never cried over a single test at Texas A&M, but I wept when I got that grade. I was devastated. And I began to just focus on that 74. And as I thought about that 74, that's the only thing that I could think about. And the more I did that, I started to think, because of that 74, I've, I've disappointed my family. Because of that 74, I'm not gonna be able to pass any of these exams. And because of that 74, I'm a complete failure. And the more I began to focus on that number 74, the bigger that problem became 
and the worse off my mindset was. And I'll never forget it. It's like it was yesterday. My dad called me one day and he said, hey, if you want to get back on track, if you're going to change your mindset and get out of this, what you've got to do is you've got to wake up every single morning and before your feet hit the floor, you've got to simply say, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. And that was difficult for me because I was so focused on that 74 and it was hard for me to want to trust God, but I started to do it. And not only would I do it when I got out of bed, I would start doing it before I studied. And the more I began to say, God, I trust you, I began to think about why do I trust him? And I remembered the reason I trust him is because Jeremiah 29, 11 says he's got a plan for my life. I began to trust him because I believe that Romans 8, 28 is true when it says that he works everything out for good, even the things we wish were differently. I began to trust him because I believed in Colossians 1.17, which tells us that he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And I began to trust him because I remembered that Romans 5.8 is true. It says, but God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And so I began to trust God. And I'll tell you, as I did that, two things began to happen. My problems got a lot smaller because my God became a lot bigger. And secondly, the bigger he became, the more I was able to rejoice in him. It's interesting, when you focus on your problems, this problem becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and your God becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. But when you start focusing on God and rejoicing in him, suddenly he gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and your problems get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so if we're gonna be people who prioritize generosity in a season of scarcity, it first starts by rejoicing in the Lord during seasons of scarcity. Let's go back to the text for just a second and look at what comes after Habakkuk rejoicing in the Lord. If you'll look down at verse 19, it says this. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. And this brings me to the second point. And it's that if we're going to prioritize generosity in a season of scarcity, we first have to rely on the Lord's strength. we got to rely on the Lord's strength. And for Habakkuk, if he was going to be generous in a season of scarcity, it was going to take nothing less than relying on the Lord's strength. And the reason is that Habakkuk believed in first fruits giving. He grew up in a season where you did first fruits giving, and that comes from Deuteronomy 26. It's a point in the Old Testament where God has delivered the Israelites to the promised land. They'd been out in the desert and they finally reached the promised land. And before they go in, he says, hey, here's what I want you to do. When you get in there, I want you to get settled. I want you to grow your crops and and raise up your cattle. And when you do that, I want you to give the first crops back to me. So when the crops spring up, I want the first ones back. And so if you think about that, It's great to have that kind of giving pattern when things are good. When the harvest is plenty, it's awesome, right? The crops come up, you put them aside to God, and then everything that comes after that is yours. But think about what it would be like to participate in first fruits giving when this is your situation. There's no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food. If you were going to give your first fruits then, it would take nothing less than relying on the Lord's strength. And so Habakkuk knew, hey, if I'm gonna give these first fruits, I'm relying because I'm trusting that God's raising up some more crops for me. And I have a question for y'all. Why do you think God asked the Israelites to give in that way? Why did he ask them to give their first fruits? Why didn't he just say, hey, let all the crops come in and then give back to me what's mine? Why did he do that? I believe it's because he wanted their whole hearts. I believe that he knew what we see in Matthew 6, 21, which says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I believe that God wanted the Israelites to start by trusting him with their whole hearts and seeing how he would meet their needs. And it's interesting, but as I think about this current economic situation that we're in, I wonder if God in his grace has led us to this point of scarcity because he wants our whole hearts. He wants us to rely fully on him and to see him provide for us. 
He wants us to rely on his strength. And I'm guessing that there's many of you in the room this morning who say, man, I'm feeling what Habakkuk is feeling. The crops don't seem to be coming in. I'm not really sure what the housing market's gonna do or what the oil market's gonna do. And the crops aren't coming in, but God is pressing on your heart this morning to trust him, to rely on his strength, that he might be speaking to you right now and saying, look, I want you to trust me with everything you've got. And I want you to prioritize generosity even when it doesn't make sense. Even when you can't see how many crops are gonna come in this month or maybe this year. I want you to trust me. I want you to rely on my strength. And if that's you, I know that maybe this morning on a Sunday morning, it's easy to feel good about that. And you're like, yes, I'll trust you, Lord. But when you get home this afternoon, it's gonna be hard. As you start to look at your budget, you're gonna say, man, I don't know if I can do it. And I just wanna encourage you, man, don't do it alone. Uh, Luann mentioned just a few minutes ago, financial peace. You've got this insert in your bulletin. I just wanna encourage you to sign up for this class. Wherever you are financially, this is a great resource. It'll teach you how to prioritize generosity, how to get out of debt, different things, budgeting tools. It's a great class. And so I'd encourage you to sign up, whether you're here at the Klein campus or at the Woodlands, you can go to the Connection Center and get information. You can even register on your phone or online. And I just wanna invite you to participate in that. Still others of you, you're sitting in here this morning and you're thinking, Sully, this is a great message for someone, but it's not me. Things are good. I'm rolling. I'm fine. The, the cows are plentiful. The crops are coming in, whatever the case may be. And you're thinking, this isn't for me. But I just want to re-challenge you. If you heard Julie last week, she asked a really good question. She said, it's not about what we give. It's about what we're not giving and why. Why are we not giving? Or what things are we not giving and surrendering back to God? And I'll tell you, as I've been processing that the last few weeks, it's been a big challenge for me. You see, I grew up in a family where we tithe. My parents, I'm thankful for them. They're here this morning. They taught me to tithe from a young age. So as long as I can remember, I've been giving 10% back to God. But the issue has become that it's so routine for me. It's almost like, hey, God, here's your cut of my salary. Here's your 10%. And so my life never has to change when I give. I just give it. And the Lord's just kind of been pressing on my heart. He's just been kind of saying, hey, I want you to prioritize generosity. How much your life be different to prioritize giving, to set that up? And I'll tell you, as an accountant who doesn't like change, I see some young adults in the room, they can tell you, I like consistency, I like Excel spreadsheets. Uh, I can tell you that's gonna take me relying on the Lord's strength. And if God's pressing on your heart this morning to give radically different, maybe it looks like taking something from savings or, or doing something different, increasing a percentage, it's gonna take relying on his strength. And so if we're gonna be people who prioritize generosity, it's gonna take us relying on his strength. After failing part one of the CPA exam, I went back and I was able to actually pass parts two, three, and four. And I came back to that first part and I was able to successfully pass it back in 2012. And so after a year working for Deloitte, uh, I was able to become a licensed CPA. Earlier this year, three years after I took part one of the CPA exam, I received a letter in the mail. It was from the Texas State Board of Public Accountancy. And they wrote to say they were auditing some exam grading keys. And they discovered that there was an error on a grading key from part one in 2012. Oh. The 74 that I had made was actually a 75. Oh. <laughs> I had passed the first time. You know, I sometimes wonder, would I have ever learned to rejoice in the Lord and rely on his strength if it hadn't have been for that 74? That was my personal season of scarcity. And I'll tell you, there's never been a time in my life where I learned to trust him more and rejoice in him more and rely on his strength if it hadn't have been for that season. And I wouldn't change it for anything. And so my prayer this morning is if you enter this room and you're saying, man, I'm in a season of scarcity. I've got a circumstance that seems so big. I just wanna encourage you to rejoice in the Lord, to rely on his strength. And I just wanna give us an opportunity to respond this morning. And by doing that, I wanna just take communion to enter into the Lord's Supper. And for all of us, just have an opportunity to just stop and refocus our attention on Jesus. 
the one who went to the cross for us, just to, to pause and be mindful of him and the sacrifice that he made. Scripture tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was eating with his disciples. And it says that he took some bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, take and eat. Shortly after, he grabbed some wine and he said, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. And so this morning, I just wanna invite all of you to come to the Lord's table and to just refocus and recenter your lives around Christ and the sacrifice that he made for us. And so I'm gonna pray. I wanna pray over a couple of groups that I think might be in the room this morning, and then we're gonna come forward. I'll give you some practical instructions. But would you just take a minute and let's just go to the Lord and and talk to him for a minute. Just ask him to move in our midst. Well, God, I am thankful for you and I'm thankful for the season of scarcity that you led me through. God, I know that you taught me so much about who you are through that season. And so God, I know right now there are people in this room, there's people online, there's people in the woodlands who are right in the middle of a season of scarcity. Maybe a spouse lost a job and so they went from two incomes to one or Maybe they got the budget cut that I was talking about earlier, but they're right in the middle of this season of scarcity and all they can see is that problem getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And all the while you're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so God, I just wanna pray right now for that group of people, Lord, that you would just allow them to trust you. And if that's you this morning, I just wanna invite you right now in the stillness of this room just to quietly say maybe to yourself or in your heart, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. And even if you're not in that season, uh, maybe you just need to be reminded of why do you trust God? Because he died for you, because of the sacrifice that he's made, whatever it might be. Why don't you just all take a minute right now and just be reminded of why it is that we trust in God and how he's a savior for us. Well, God, I do ask that you would allow people to leave this room today. And maybe it's just like me. It's the first time they're just gonna say, God, I trust you and help them to build that trust over the next couple of weeks. But God, I also wanna pray for another group that I think that's in here. And that's the group that's feeling like you're tugging on their hearts to prioritize generosity in a way that they never have before. In a new way, a different way. Maybe it's increasing their tithe from 10% to 15. I don't know, but God, you're leading them and you're calling them to trust you to do something different. And it's gonna take faith. It's gonna take stepping out on the water. And so God, I wanna pray over that group, just the verse that you showed me in Thessalonians this week, that Paul was praying for the Thessalonians. He said this, my prayer is that our God would make you worthy of his calling and by his power, He would bring to fruition every desire for goodness and every deed prompted by faith. And so God, I just ask for people to rely on your power, to rely on your strength as you're prompting them to, excuse me, to step out in faith. God, would you lead us this morning? Give us the grace to trust you and know that you're God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, the Grow Group Director, and I'm here with our business administrator, Michael Sullivan, who just brought part three of our Transform series called Prioritize. Very timely message today, I think, for for us and for a lot of people. Um, 
And so we talked, you talked about when you find yourself in this season of scarcity, um, how do you respond? What is, what is God calling us to respond? And so I have a question about that. Mm -hmm. um, when, you, when you enter into this time, like if it's a bad test score, if it's an accident, if it's a loss of a job, um, whatever the incident may be that kind of triggers moving into this season, mm -hmm. how do we not respond in our flesh? How do we trust God and not respond in ways that are natural to us, like anger or blame? Mm -hmm. how, how do we do that? Well, I can say, <clears throat> in my experience, at first I was angry. I mean, I even said that in the, at the I was devastated. When you, when you face those situations, you're going to, to feel that way, and so it, it then becomes, okay, what am I gonna do to move forward? And I think there's a couple of things that I can say that really helped me. One, you know, I mentioned my dad, um, but I also had three roommates that I lived with who were all sitting for the CPA exam, who were all believers that encouraged me and helped me walk through that. And so if you're in this situation where you're angry and where things are hard, you've got to be in community to help point you back to the gospel, to help remind you of God's truth because you don't want to believe that in the moment. You want uh, to believe differently and that's the temptation is to believe differently. Uh, so I'd say that's the first thing is you really have to pursue community and you know at Faith Bridge we have our grow groups. You got to invest in those um, and jump in especially if you find yourself. The second thing is it's just really pouring into scripture and, and seeing over and over again, all throughout scripture, Jesus didn't say it was gonna be easy. He told us there was gonna be suffering. He told us there would be hardship. And you see Paul, Paul wrote Philippians from prison. Habakkuk is in this great depression. Uh, we've got Paul writing to Thessalonians who were being persecuted and he's saying, hey, it's gonna be by his power and moving forward with faith, being prompted by faith. And I think that's what we have to do is move forward with the faith that we have. And so oftentimes God meets us there. Um, he moves with the faith that we have, not with the faith that we're going to need in the future. He meets us right in the moment. And so I think that's really important to highlight. Mm, that's good. And so, um, what, what are my resources when, if I'm trying to balance my budget, if I'm looking at how I can give mm -hmm. or the season that I'm in, um, what resources does FaithBridge have for me? Sure. I mean, obviously we mentioned one in the sermon and one in the announcements today, and that's Financial Peace University. And that starts in January, and that's a great resource for people. They can uh, get plugged into that class. Uh, I believe there's scholarships available Absolutely. if you need help. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a great class because it walks you through your budget. It, it helps you look at things differently. Um, if you're sitting there and you're saying, well, that's January. I'm in November mm -hmm. right now. I need this now. Uh, on Financial Peace's website, they have a budgeting tool it's called Every Dollar. Great tool, you can log on, there's a free version. There's also, I think you can pay a little bit uh, to use an upgraded version, but there's a version there that helps you plug in your budget and really think about the decisions that you're making. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other resources out there. I know there's Mint.com is a popular one that helps you see what are other people spending in your area, what's normal. And I think that can sometimes be mm -hmm. helpful just from a standpoint of, oh my gosh, I'm really eating out a lot and maybe you don't even realize it. I think even walking through transparency, I'll tell you something that's really helped me recently is like I mentioned I got married. Well, I had to sit down and walk line item through line item with Jill and kind of talk about, hey, this is our budget. This is what I'm thinking. And her and I really engaged in that conversation together. And it makes you realize, oh, this is where my priority is pretty quickly because mm -hmm. you're explaining to someone else, hey, this is why I'm spending my money the way that I am. Um, we often talk about stewardship being a spiritual decision, that every line in our checkbook mm -hmm. or every swipe of the credit card is a spiritual decision. And, I, and so I think I would encourage you, find somebody you trust who's not going to go you know, publicize your W-2 or whatever, but walk with them and say, hey, this is where I'm spending my money and, and, and just kind of show them that transparency gives you a chance to really see, oh, this is my heart behind this. Is you have to explain why you're spending the money the way you are. It's very helpful. So again, I mean, that goes back to community. There's so many great resources and um, there's a lot of stuff online that you can look up, but that's where I would lead people to. Great, and a very practical ways. Um, and thank you for your your transparency today um, in sharing just what you've been through um, and what God has taught you through that. And even, 
is still teaching you through this season uh -huh. as well. So thank you. We, sure. we appreciate your message today. Thanks. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week for part four. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.